Hello folks, Q here. This week we're going to be doing the finale for Compound. Um, hope you enjoy it and the content so far. We're going to be building a power plant this week. A few different things thrown in there. Some scatter terrain and a few other bits and bobs. Uh, you keep smashing that like and subscribe and we'll keep smashing these videos out for you. Now we're the Andy. We'll be giving you a breakdown of some sci-fi lore and history. Hope you enjoy it. Like and subscribe. Hey guys and welcome back to the Try Hard Workshop where we're continuing on with our sci-fi mega build. So, let's get stuck in. Last week, we did a deep dive into the history of 40k, how it developed from its earliest influences, and how it's become the referential cornerstone of modern sci-fi wargaming. We hammered a few points about real life influencing scenery construction, and how that extends to science fiction. So Blade Runner was people from LA imagining the city in the far future, or Gilliam's Brazil imagined a world taken over by very 1980s looking technology. Modern sci-fi is informed by modern society. We make what we know. Understanding the history of the cultural processes involved, it leads us to ask the question, where is sci-fi at right now? Because every other day, some new invention broadens our speculative horizon, but we just keep imagining the next incredible milestone. Armed with our imagination, love of sci-fi, and our particular cultural lens, Let's find out where science fiction has come from and maybe get a glimpse of where it's going. I want to begin with one of our favourite stories of culture affecting science fiction. Isaac Asimov was probably the most foundational author of the first golden age of science fiction. He gave us The Laws of Robotics, Terrible Will Smith spin-off, The Foundation series and countless other classics. Yet, would you believe that he originally found it impossible to get published. Not because he was a terrible writer, but because of cultural bias within the American sci-fi scene. The main vehicle for sci-fi at the time was pulp fiction magazines, with astounding science fiction being top dog. Its editor, John W. Campbell, now considered a controversial character, exemplified the type of man an aspiring author would have to get past. These men published pretty much one type of sci-fi, galactic federations. Not just that, but humanity was always at the top. We were the smartest, we had the best ships, the biggest muscles, and all the alien women that we could handle. Asimov, being of Slavic descent, thought the galactic federation trope just reflected real world politics. The Anglo-Saxon archetype was at the top of the federation and it cascaded down a cultural bias bell curve. Asimov wrote humans as nothing special, with fantastical alien characters driving the story. Every story was rejected until Asimov had a realisation. If he couldn't talk about aliens being better, then he would write stories about robots. The prevailing notion at the time was that mechanical automation was just around the corner, and the automatons would be, at least physically, better than us. So an American audience was ready for that kind of story. To drive home the irony of it all, Asimov poured Carol Capek's word robot for his protagonist automatons, which has Slavic roots in the notion of forced labour. So alien stories bad, robot stories acceptable. Asimov understood the cultural boundaries of science fiction and found they weren't in his favour, so he changed the rules of the game. Of course, we've come a long way since the 1940s. We live in a world unimaginable in the days of astounding science fiction. So, where are we at now? We've covered that culture informs the type of science fiction we make. The Asimov example is dark, but it happens in every way possible. Asimov is also a deeply historical example. So let's take a look at Blade Runner and its sequel to see how cultural expectations change. The Blade Runner of 1982 was set in 2020, and in some ways their interpretation wasn't too far off. But its failure to visualise the radical changes we actually experienced is obvious when examining the cultural lens through which it was created. 
The LA of 2020 was imagining capitalism transformed into a post-industrial space. And it wasn't good. Ecological disaster underpinned the narrative, but didn't play a big role, as global warming was just a fringe theory at the time. Rising multiculturalism and the idea of the metropolitan city fed into the whole Neo-Tokyo vibe, without which we wouldn't have the scene of Gaff accosting Deckard at the ramen spot. So 2020's LA rose out of the cultural anxieties and ambition of 1980's America. So how is the sequel different? Blade Runner 2049 released into a world racked by the genuine and present danger of ecological collapse. Its hyper-defined cityscapes are more relatable to our eyes, but you'll notice a key difference between Villeneuve's LA and its predecessor. We actually got to explore the ecological wastelands. The film begins at the desaturated farmlands where nothing grows, then dives into the sandblasted wastelands outside the city. In a scene reminiscent of the original book's protagonist meeting Mercer, we met Deckard. Ecological collapse was a fringe in the original movie, whereas here, it's front and centre. Consider the movie's main antagonist, Neander Wallace. Yes, he's a dickhead, and yes, that isn't helped by the fact he's played by Jared Leto. But he's not totally unsympathetic. Within the degraded post-industrial world, Wallace presents a tenacious character who screams back into the void. Consider the glut of apocalypse movies we got in the 2000s. Critic Mark Fisher claimed they were so popular because at the time, it was easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. In that sense, Wallace is sympathetic because the conceit of Blade Runner is apocalypse. The colonies that Tannhauser gets, the last hope of humanity, are made into a lie by Roy Batty. Unicorn arguments aside, Deckard ends 2020 as a fugitive, with no real hope of happiness. Against this hopelessness and an evolution of the 2000s fetish for apocalypse, Wallace presents a pragmatic way for humanity to thrive. It's no accident then that Wallace reflects the modern ideal of a tech billionaire, whereas Eldon Tyrell plays as the out of touch old money type. Blade Runner 2020 had a solid lawman story. It's Dirty Harry hunting robots. By the end of the day, Deckard was there to reinforce the normative hierarchies. It's humans versus replicants. In 2049, that story is far more complicated. The protagonist is a replicant, then isn't, then thinks he's the replicant messiah, then we discover some side character from Act 2 is actually the Replicant Messiah. All of a sudden, you've got 15 layers of cultural complexity reflecting our own society's views on equality, inclusion, and how complicit we are in maintaining unethical institutions. I think we can see then that cultural expectations of both content creators and consumers change over time, and they choose more often than not to reflect and comment on present circumstances. You know, we shouldn't really call it science fiction anymore. Yes, speculative fiction is a genre of its own, but it's a genre that's radically expanded in the past 20 years. Partly because we get closer to the science and further from the fiction every year. So how do we sci-fi content creators respond to that? Well, first it seems to be to make some of the greatest content that's ever been made. We're currently in a golden age of television. We used to depend on Star Trek or Farscape for our kicks. Now, we've got a whole range and it's increasingly portrayed with stark realism over the fantastic. Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror is a great example. 
and as the title suggests, it presents a speculative black mirror of the near future. The uncomfortable possible realities that Brooker portrays are often eerily similar to our own. It's not outside the realms of possibility with current technology that his episode Nosedive could come to pass. It takes place in a world where people can rate interactions with each other out of five on a global social media platform. This platform naturally comes to inform socioeconomic status and serves as a commentary on our world where increasingly your online presence can heavily affect your offline reality. Another great example is The Handmaid's Tale. It initially showed us the hyper-exploitative world of the book, but after the first series, modern audiences demanded more. We wanted to know what was going on outside Gilead. What did the rest of the world think? Was there a resistance? None of that's covered in the book's intentionally blinkered narrative. So when they came to expand the universe, the showrunners had rich material to draw from in the political culture of 2016 through to 2020. Television aside, some of the best sci-fi is being produced for video games, whether it's Gordon Freeman trying to take a gnome into space, Chell being bullied by the nightmare daughter of the HAL 9000, or the real-time Atlas Shrug simulator that is Bioshock. Sci-fi has continued to flourish on these platforms and has produced work that reinterprets and retells classic work. Bioshock shows us the evils of the excesses of unchecked capitalism. Portal shows us the evils of unchecked capitalism, and the Horizon series shows us that dinosaurs are cooler when they're giant robots. But that's not where the real content is being made. For that, you have to crawl into the deepest internet lurk spaces and hang out with the punks. Have you ever noticed how many punks there are around here? Diesel punks, cyberpunks, steampunks, with their funny hair and strange clothes? Seriously, our genre has split into hundreds of different fandoms. And with the rise of the internet, we've connected with international communities. We've created huge content platforms, endless short fiction, and countless forums. One of the reasons it's all so unique and amazing is that everyone has their own way of creating sci-fi. But to stay consistent, we coalesce around these punks and fandoms. We create coherent settings based in universes with shared rules. The cutting edge example of that process, and pretty much everything we've talked about today, is solar punk. This genre imagines a world after the apocalypse. But instead of humanity dwindling into extinction, it's about small bands of capable individuals fighting against the wasteland. Jacking together solar panels, restoring the farmland, Rebuilding better than ever. It's a genre that takes another step beyond the early 2000s fetishization of the world's end and asks, what if we can make it after all? What if, after we've destroyed our modern way of life, a nugget of human nobility can rise from the wastelands like a weed? Because in a world where the apocalypse is barely fiction, we really need stories like that. Or we can just build giant robot dinosaurs that we can somehow hunt with a bow and arrow.
That's all for this week. Until next time, try hard. See you later, boys.